I personally uh, uh, think that we have the acute phase of the financial crisis largely behind us. The damage that has been done to the system has to affect, in my opinion, the real economy. And the effect of that is only beginning to be felt. The housing uh, problem is, I think, continues to be the leading factor as far as the real economy is concerned. Because just as they overshot on the upside, they will also overshoot on the downside. And they are currently, the house prices are accelerating on the downside. I think this administration, uh, ideologically, is not prepared uh, to intervene. And there's also strong public opinion against bailing out uh, the lenders or uh, borrowers who have uh, gone to an excess. And we now have a rally. And I, th I think this is a fairly typical bear market rally. I may be wrong, but I think this is it. This is a bear market rally. We're going through a tough period right now. But as I said, the long-term fundamentals of uh, the U.S. economy, I think, are very strong. And I think they compare very favorably with other major economies around the world. And I believe uh, that those long-term uh, fundamentals are going to be reflected in the value of our currency. We're not calling for a second stimulus plan right now. We're working on making some of these other programs work. These payments will provide a boost to the U.S. economy as we go through a difficult patch. Our economy has been growing for more than six straight years when growth started to slow down last winter. And it has remained slow in the first part of 2008. The ongoing housing correction and volatility in the financial markets are causing many Americans to feel uncertain. That is understandable and reasonable. We are working to minimize the impact of the housing correction on the rest of the U.S. economy. But we do not want to impede its progress because the sooner the correction is completed, the sooner we will see home value stable. Now, the dollar, as we showed you, weaker versus the euro today after the ECB kept interest rates unchanged. Our next guest says that weakness will continue even if the Fed's interest rate cuts are nearing an end. So what's the best way to play the falling greenback if indeed that does continue to be the trend? Diane Garnick here from Invesco. Diane, you really see dollar weakness going forward. A lot of people... It's a contrarian view. Let me just put it that way. Well, it's interesting because it was, a, a uh, you know, strong view on a weak dollar, let's say in the beginning of the summer, where people said, oh, the almighty dollar, how could you think that? And the, the weakness in the dollar we've seen for a long time. Think about, you know, we have grown up in an environment where most investors around today believe that the dollar has been the only currency, the standard around. But the dollar is only really, what, since the end of the Second World War. So it's only really been the standard for 60 years. What's driving the... It's a long time for you and me. Well, yeah, especially for me. So what's important here <laughs> is that the weakness that we see in the dollar is a fundamental structural change. It's not some short-term technical change. And by that I mean we have, you know, the, the European Union was broken up into so many different countries. They finally have band together. And they're really in the, at the on stage of this whole new currency regime. It took a few years for the EU to take off, right, for the, for the euro to really become, take a foothold in Europe. But my gosh, it's happened. And what we're seeing is the direct result in the weakness in the dollar. I just, you know, we've heard some uh, Fed officials say there may be interest rate uh, rises coming along. I think Thomas Hoenig said a couple days ago it was a possibility. And a lot of people are speculating that the European economy could get so weak that they have to cut rates over there. Wouldn't that? I, I don't understand. I'm very confused. Some people are saying that the European economy could become so weak that they're going to have to cut rates, and this happens on the day that the ECB says, oh, we're going to hold off because of inflation. I mean, these two don't usually happen at the same time. You either have a weak economy or you have an economy that's, you know, fueled with inflation. So I would think the fellows that are making these kind of comments, oh, the, you know, Europe's going to fall off the, the you know, fall off and be very weak, maybe they're, they don't have access to the same kind of data that, let's say, the ECB has, right? So but what about the Fed? I mean, even if the Fed does pause here or even if the Fed 
eventually starts raising rates, you think that there's going to be the lag is going to be uh, big enough to help create dollar weakness. I mean, let's think about what the Fed has done. The Fed eased and eased. What is it? Seven times since September. That's an all. And you know, people say seven times since September, and they don't. They fail to remember we also had a lot of initiatives on the part of the Fed where they just eased over and over, brought in newfangled tools and instruments, right? Introduced new instruments, <laughs> um, dusted off old instruments to add even more liquidity. So yes, there's a lag there, and that lag is going to take quite some time. The problem here is the Fed doesn't have that many more bullets to really use here. So I think that we have an overabundance of liquidity in the market. All eyes have changed over the last couple of weeks. People no longer ask, what is the Fed going to do? What is the Fed going to do? Is it 25? Is it 50? People are asking, how long is it going to take until we end this quote unquote recession that we're in now. All right, so you brought one way to play this uh, here. Let's take a look at the chart and uh, tell me, I mean, it looks like we've already seen a lot of strength in this power share that you have. Uh, how much further do you think we're going to go here? It's interesting. This power share, this is called the UDN, and what it does is when the dollar goes down, the value of this ETF goes up. Right? So one of the things that's really important is over the last year, we've seen this tremendous growth, 11%. Right, growth in the UDN. But what's key here is if you believe that the dollar is going to continue to do poorly, that's the instrument that you should be looking at as an individual to just get exposure to the short dollar. Right? It's effectively a basket of currencies outside. So if you look at the, the history of the spot dollar, right, the index, it continues to go down. We've seen a little bit of flattening in that dramatic cut off, but you know, that weakness is there. How low do you think we could go? I mean, let's put it in euro terms because the basket isn't so much fun to deal uh, with. You know, it's kind of interesting. I, I had to laugh. A lot of people are giving all of these new oil estimates, right? We've heard all of these oil estimates, 125, 130, 140. 150, 200. There we go. See, spoken like a true Coming Amazon of analyst Sachs. of there years ago, right? So it's interesting. When we think about the dollar, one of the reasons that oil prices and all of these commodity prices can be so high is because they're denominated in dollars, right? You bring those oil prices back into euro terms, all of a sudden it doesn't look like this dramatically high price. So I think you can't really ask one question without addressing the other. And that's why I think the dollar could be in big trouble because as we find out, you know, do Americans, U.S. dollar-based companies are not the only ones buying inputs. Right? So when you're buying in euro, the, the, the rising price of oil isn't all that traumatic. Let's talk quickly about how this affects the U.S. economy, because obviously if the dollar is weaker, it doesn't matter if you're not traveling outside the U.S., except for the fact that your gas and everybody drives all over the place here gets more expensive. How does this affect so the economy true. going forward? Right. I mean, that's exactly what Americans need, right? More SUVs, because we just apparently don't have enough of them. The price of gas is absolutely growing, but what we're seeing is this debate about whether or not we have a recession. Remember, technically for a recession, you need two consecutive periods of declining GDP. So people have asked, you know, someone said to me the other day, oh, it's purely academic. And I thought, to, uh, maybe that's true. Maybe if you're in the economics department of a university, you're very concerned about the theory. But if you're in the finance department of a university, you're very worried about how do I make money? Right? And, and uh, well, I think the truth of the matter is we're going to have slowing GDP for a while, but it might not be as problematic. We're starting to finally get some robust data. All right, Diane, thanks so much for joining us. We could go on for hours and hours, and maybe, you know, after the show we can do that. Thanks.